Welcome to the Doctor's Life Podcast with Diane Ansari Wynn, MD. Dr. Diane is a stress and burnout coach for doctors. With her 15 years of experience as an anesthesiologist and certification as a physician development coach, Dr. Diane coaches doctors on how to live a rich life of purpose, fulfillment, freedom, and happiness both at work and at home. In this podcast, Dr. Diane brings together doctors and researchers that are experts in health, wellness, stress, and burnout, as well as doctors that have been successful in clinical practice, academics, non-clinical careers, and business to share their expertise and life experience so that you can live your own life purpose, fulfillment, freedom, and happiness. To get free access to a PDF and video of easy and proven strategies that melt stress away and keep it away, simply register at www.dianeansari-win.com. That's www.dianeansari-win.com. Now here is your host, Dr. Diane Ansari Win. Hi, it's Dr. Diane here, and I have a quick request before we jump into the show. If you like this podcast, it would mean so much if you took just a moment to hop over to iTunes, write a review, and rate the show. That is how other people will find the show and get the same great value from it that I hope that you're getting. It just takes a few moments to click a star rating and write a quick note. Now, on to the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Doctor's Life podcast. Today, I am so thrilled to be interviewing Dr. Andrea Dunning. She is a veterinarian, a founder, and CEO of the East Atlanta Animal Clinic in Atlanta, Georgia. And we're going to be talking today about what a veterinary practice is like and some of the unique uh, stressors that are in the office, some things that are common and um, not as common, um, comparing the veterinary office to a human medicine office. And Dr. Dunnings has done some super interesting, innovative, and practical things in the office um, to help to mitigate some of the stresses uh, that has um, that she's been experiencing in her practice, and um, we are going to talk about that at depth. And hopefully, you guys will get some tips and strategies uh, to be able to help to uh, mitigate stress in your office setting as well. Uh, Dr. Denning, so so great to have you today. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Well, thank you for having me, Diane. I really appreciate the opportunity. Why don't you tell us about yourself, how you got into veterinary medicine? Um, We were just talking right before we started recording, and I was commenting on how um, incredibly competitive it is since um, there are a lot fewer veterinary schools than there are um, human medicine schools. And um, how you got into medicine and where you studied and how you in your journey to uh, where you are now as the founder and CEO of the East Atlanta Animal Clinic. Sure, I'd love to. Um, I actually am one of the lucky ones. Um, a lot of people these days um, find veterinary medicine as a second career path, um, but I was lucky enough to decide that that was my destiny um, in my teenage years. I was always very good at math and science in elementary school and high school. And so one year I decided to volunteer at a um, hospital, a human hospital, and I'm going to date myself because I actually was a candy striper, which oh, they no too. longer have. <laughs> I know what that is. <laughs> Um, and so I did that one summer um, between uh, school um, sessions, and I just didn't find it that fulfilling. Um, I was intrigued by the medicine, but did not find the day-to-day interactions that fulfilling. And then the next uh, summer, I had the opportunity to volunteer at my local veterinary clinic, and it was the worst and the best summer of my life. Um, it was the summer that parvovirus, um, hit Metro Atlanta. And for people who don't know, parvo is a virus that attacks the lining of intestines and it causes them to slough. And mm-hmm. so puppies and dogs who get it 
um, end up with very profuse vomiting and bloody diarrhea. And that summer, it was a brand new virus to the metro Atlanta area. There was no known treatment for it. And of course, because it's a virus, there's no cure for it. And so puppies were dying left and right. Hmm. And um, I, as a volunteer, got assigned to the sick ward, which meant Every day coming in, finding puppies dead in their kennels, unfortunately, and it just broke my heart Hmm. every single day. But um, there was one puppy who came in who um, didn't die the first night. Um, She's still very sick, but because she made it through the first night, the next day I had to give her um, a couple of baths because, you know, she had no control over her vomiting or diarrhea, Mm-hmm. And you didn't want them just laying in, you know, the waste. Right. And so um, I formed a bond with her, needless to say. And I'd always had pets growing up. But this was something very different. And I found myself, I'm sorry, I'm going to get a little emotional. But I found myself right. um, willing this little puppy to live. Mm-hmm. And each day she continued to improve. And the day that she went home, it's like a burned image in my mind mm-hmm. of her walking out the door with her little tail wet. Oh. And it just was the most profound moment, or one of the most profound moments. I should say my son would be disappointed if I had uh, to <laughs> <at> his birth. <laughs> but it was one of the most profound moments in my life. And it was at that moment that I said, this is what I'm going to do. Wow. And, uh, from that point on... Every class that I took, well, in high school, you don't get that many choices, but I did make sure that I was very heavily staffed in the science and the math fields. And when I um, got ready to go to college, um, I was telling you earlier that I did go to Northwestern um, in Chicago, and it was a school that I loved the opportunity um, to attend. But once I got in, I realized that I was lumped in with the pre-meds and the pre-dents. And back at that time, the prerequisites for entry in the vet school were were very different. They required a lot of animal husbandry and animal science classes. And so I had a very difficult course ahead of me, uh, which was going to require me going to school full-time during the regular year, but also going to school during the summer to get my prerequisites in order to be able to apply to vet school. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Um, one summer taking one of those prerequisite classes, I um, became friends with another student who is now one of my colleagues, and um, she was pre a pre-vet student at University of Georgia, and she was telling me about all the animal science classes she was taking and the zoology classes she was taking, and I was like, oh, my gosh, I need to look into this. Right. And so I did, and I made the decision, you know, within a couple of weeks that summer to transfer from Northwestern to the University of Georgia. And so that's where I received my bachelor's from, um, and that's where I received my DVM degree from. Because my backup plan was if I did not get into vet school, because it is so competitive, to go back to um, get my master's and, and to teach biology. That's just how much of a science person I am. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But... Um, After graduation, um, I stayed in the metro Atlanta area and practiced in several different parts of the city until I opened my own practice in um, 2002. And um, it's been a very rewarding journey at times, but it's also been a very stressful and difficult journey at times because, you know, veterinary school has changed a lot, but back at the time that I um, attended, you really didn't get a lot of practice management courses. And so there was kind of this mantra of build it and they will come. But along with that was the underlying statement that it was expected you were going to have to work 70 to 80 hours a week in order to, you know, make the kind of income and have the kind of living that would provide, you know, a comfortable lifestyle for yourself. And hopefully you would be able to retire at the age of 70. Um, wow. And, you know, wow. it's a rewarding profession, but when you look at the disparities amongst the income for what veterinarians do versus what MDs do versus even what dentists do, there's a drastic difference. 
And I actually feel sorry for a lot of the newly graduated veterinarians now because they are now graduating with, you know, hundreds of thousands of debt because the cost of school has gone up so much. But yet mm-hmm. still their incomes are not able to keep pace with the debt that they owe. So yeah. there's that part of the stress situation. And then if you throw any sort of changes in the economy in there, because most people pay for their pets, you know, medical care through their disposable income. Mm-hmm. So if they're having a hard economic time, then Fifi's probably not going to get her shots that year. Or if Fifi is sick, it's probably going to be a one-time visit to the vet, but probably not, you know, a big investment in everything that Fifi needs to stay healthy. Right. So that is a challenge in and of itself. And insurance is different on the veterinary side than it is on the human side, which is a good thing in a way Mm -hmm. um, because you get to choose your own doctor. But at the same time, we don't get any sort of financial, you know, reimbursement from that. So, again, we are still completely dependent upon the owner's ability to pay. So when you look at that and you look at the cost of, you know, practice ownership and the cost of staff and the cost of equipment. Um, you know, I recently invested in a cold laser unit last year. Well, mm-hmm. that piece of equipment cost me $24,000. You yeah. know, people don't understand how that cost equates to the fees that we have to charge you in order to provide the service for your pet. You know, the, the previous philosophy with that medicine used to be because you love animals, you should do it for free. But that's not the case. I mean, we we still want to provide a living for ourselves and for our staff and for our children. You know, it it still has to make business sense for us to be able to have the doors stay open. Right. So the fact that I started my practice from the ground up, I'm client number one, you know, in my practice management software, that was a huge amount of stress, you know, Mm -hmm. already coupled with the fact that, You know, I had no client roster whatsoever, and I was taking on all this debt and really had to just have faith that people were going to come and, you know, and seek our services. But then there's other parts to, you know, the whole aspect of stressors and whatnot because turnover with um, staff is uh, very high in the industry because most vets can't afford to pay a lot of um, the really skilled employees what they're worth. You know, there's the equivalent of a nurse on the veterinary side called a veterinary technician. Mm -hmm. Um, In the state of Georgia, it requires a two-year degree, and you have to be registered with the state as an actual license that you're awarded. Yeah. The number of techs that are graduating from tech school, they can't keep up with the demand for that position. But a lot of techs end up, you know, either moving out of state or, not not using their license um, if they can't get the pay that they feel like they deserve. Well, a lot of that, too, is dependent upon the economy. And so one of the big things that we faced was, you know, in 2009, when the economy went south on everyone, I was one of the lucky few that it didn't have a major impact on me right away, but it did eventually catch up with me in 2011. But a lot of um, veterinary clinics were laying people off you know, at that particular point in time. Um, So there's that part of, of, you know, the economic situation, but then there's also the fact that the job itself requires an intense amount of loyalty and dedication, and oftentimes you're doing very long or working very long hours, and you're not being compensated sometimes in what people feel like is a fair manner. And so if you add all those things into the employee equation, it can create a very disgruntled kind of environment for employees, you know, Mm -hmm. if they don't feel appreciated because a lot of them just want to work in a place where they really feel appreciated. So that's stressor number two, the fact that you're trying to um, attract people who will be loyal to to the practice, loyal to the clientele, and provide them with a quality of life and pay that's going to allow them to, you know, meet their needs um, and at the same time have a workplace culture that's inviting and welcoming to the client. Because right. even though dogs and cats are our patients, it's the clients, their owners, who decide whether or not to bring them in. Mm-hmm. And so we have to, to 
depend upon building that relationship with the owner to get them to trust us to be able to give them sound advice and to create a connection of trust and camaraderie and we're in this together and we're going to make these decisions together, it it really requires that three-way partnership. There's the patient, the client, and the vet. Right. And the secondary aspect of the vet is the vet staff because if it's not coming directly from me, it's coming from my technician or my assistant. You know, so they have to trust that what they're being told is the best thing for their pet. So that was stressor number two. And then the third aspect of it that's unique to veterinary medicine is the fact that there is an undeniable thing called compassion fatigue. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I have one pet, but I have many pets. Right. There's only one that physically lives with me, but there are so many that I consider to be my pet that I see you know, several times a year or, you know, every two months because they've got some sort of clinical condition or whatnot. And so when you start to build that bond with that pet like it's your own pet, then as you walk that pet through their life stages and you experience their ups and downs, then when it comes time to say goodbye to that pet, Mm -hmm. it impacts you just as much as it impacts the owner, you know. And, And that's what is the wonderful part of the human-animal bond and the wonderful part of the client-patient, um, you know, that relationship. But at the same time, it's devastating. I mean, the ability to euthanize a patient is an awesome responsibility in the amount of weight that it carries. And that sometimes can become a burden if you don't really know how to release that stress and to not take it on. You know, I used to, to think that every time I euthanized the pet that it was taking a little piece of my soul. Mm-hmm. And in a way, it does. But the universe has a way of replenishing you, so to speak, if you recognize it. Because the next one that comes in the door that's the six-week-old puppy or the eight-week-old kitten or whatever, it is the next sign of life renewing itself. Right. You know? Right. So you have to be able to recognize that for what it is and accept it for what it is. But if you're if you get so bogged down in the day to day of all of these different things and just the weight of it all and the emotion aspect of it all or emotional aspect of it all, it can be a very um stressful type of environment. It can lead to burnout and the suicide rate amongst veterinarians is actually increasing and has been documented, um, you know, in Europe and in Australia as um, something that's on the the rise. And I hate to say it, but if you go in in any room of, you know, 10, 20 veterinarians and ask them how many people or how many of them know of someone who's committed suicide in the profession, you know, 40, 50 percent of the room might raise a hand. Is that right? Oh, boy. Yeah. So it's it's all of that that um, that kind of makes um, veterinary medicine um, unique amongst the medical professionals um, in terms of the things that we deal with. But I also am one of those people that is um, always looking for ways to improve, and. Um, I'm not really one of those people that you can't say no to, but I always feel like there's an answer Mm -hmm. to a problem. And um, I just was determined that I was not going down that path um, to burnout or, you know, to depression or whatever you want to call it, like some other people would be. So Mm -hmm. that made me determined to find a different way of doing things. Right. And a different way of practicing. How were you able to manage this? stress um, in your, you know, you have the personal stress of um, feeling the stress of the day-to-day actually caring for your patients, interacting with mm-hmm. their owners, and um, and then being the owner and um, of, a, of a clinic, um, having your staff and um, making sure that they're doing their jobs and that they're cared for. As how would it? How did you 
take care? Had you already taken care of yourself? Did you add that on later? And um, and what did you do? And then we can talk about what you've instituted in your practice. Um, no, I, I was not in the habit of of taking care of myself. My work life balance was completely upside down. Um, I was one of those that was definitely on the path of you know working seventy hours a week. And just, you know, nose to the grindstone, we got to get it done, we got to get it done, we got to get it done. And then in 2014, um, I don't know exactly what it was, but, but something changed for me um, that made me start to question the way that I was not only running my practice, but the way that I was living my life personally. Mm-hmm. And um, I happened to attend a three-day Oprah weekend that year, and it was it was very inspiring to me personally, but what I was in absolute awe of was just the way that she had managed to engage her employees to follow this dream of hers, to put this event on, and to create such an amazing experience for everyone in attendance in that dome. Mm-hmm. And um, and so that to me was the question that would help me figure out everything else. How do I engage the employees and the rest of the staff to really buy into what it is that I want to do. And as part of that, I started looking at myself in terms of how was I showing up as the owner on a day-to-day basis Mm -hmm. and what kind of impact was that uh, having on the employee culture. And so I kind of went haywire in 2015. I went to a women's business seminar, and I actually hired a business coach, a personal coach, and an HR consultant all at the same time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I just dived in. What I learned was as I recognized some of my imperfections as a person and some of my um, mindset issues, I realized how that was having an impact on the practice, but then I also realized how it was impacting some of my choices for those people I was surrounding myself with. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that allowed me to just throw the doors wide open and just take a fresh look at everything. And from September of 2015 to end of December of last year, I called it 15 months of ripping off the (laughs) Band-Aid. Because wherever the problem was, I was ripping it off and exposing it, and it was going to be raw for a minute and it was going to be painful for a minute but it was ultimately going to help speed the healing process mm-hmm. and um, within that time period I was lucky enough to um, hire a new manager and she introduced me to what's called fish philosophy it's a philosophy for workplaces that revolves around four um, ideas and it's based on fishermen's uh, warehouse in I believe it's Seattle Okay. Seattle or Portland, but the concepts are pretty simple. The four mantras are play, be there, make their day, and choose your attitude. And something about it just spoke to me in terms of we want to play. We want to have fun while we're doing what we're doing. We want to choose our attitude because just because you are tired and whatnot doesn't mean that you have the right to show up that way to the client and the patient in the exam room. And then making their day is about, you know, really creating that ultimate client experience and, you know, being there, being there to listen to them and actively listening and actively making a connection. That's all a part of what we're ultimately supposed to be doing as part of the profession anyway. So after I got introduced to the concept, we got the team together, went out to dinner one night and watched the video and broke up into groups. And I told them, I don't want to be like any other clinic. I want us to figure out how to do this daily work on a daily basis, but with fun and enthusiasm and in a way that allows us to do our best work. So brainstorm, be creative, come up with your best ideas, and then we'll see what we can implement. And we got like three pages worth of of ideas out Mm -hmm. of that one two-hour session. And we made a point of sitting down and um, and doing something related to what we call the fish escapades every single month. But it, it's taken on mindset issues such as we had a um, person come in and do 
um, a lunch hour that was geared around yoga med- uh, meditation. Mm-hmm. Um, we had a massage therapist come in and give chair massages, you know, to people as they freed up in between appointments. We also had silly things like we typically wear specific uniform colors every single day, but we designated Friday as fun scrub day, so you can wear whatever, <laughs> you know, scrub you wanted to wear. Mm-hmm. Um we brought in baby pictures and posted one every day. Guess who this is? Oh, you that's know. fun. I played that game. Yeah. <laughs> Simple little things like that. And then as a group, um, because this is stuff that was happening on a monthly or a daily basis, but then as a group for the entire team to bond, we committed to doing something once a quarter. So one quarter we ended up um, all doing an improv class together. That was hilarious, yeah. you know, in terms of, of really breaking down walls. and it, it, It's hard to be scared to speak to someone when you've seen them rolling around on the floor barking like a dog. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, right? it just kind of, you know, takes you to a different level in your relationship with your teammate. Mm-hmm. And um, another um, quarter we, um, we did uh, sip and strokes. So we sent pictures of our um, personal pets to an art studio and um, went together after work one day. And the artists taught us each other how, how to paint the um, the portraits and whatnot. Oh, and you know we had a little food and a little wine, and we were laughing and walking around looking at one another's paintings. And I mean, it just was something that everyone really, really enjoyed doing because it was pet related once. Uh, first of all, but also because it was, you know, something that we had not done before. It was a unique experience. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, things like that. And then um, we got some of the vendors to contribute to things. We had one that gave us an ice cream truck that parked outside the clinic one day and free ice cream for us and the clients. There you, you know, go. Yeah. 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 Just, just simple little things. And then all the things that we came up with brainstorming-wise for the clients, you know, have gone over well. Um, one of them was while clients were waiting in the exam room to doodle their pet on the bottom of the form, and, you know, some of the drawings that we got were just hilarious. Um, we had a Halloween pet costume contest and things that are simple but at the same time fun, um, a secret client of the word, a uh, secret word of the day for clients. If they said the secret word, then they got a special prize. You know, it, just things to kind this of great. make light of, yeah, so yeah, to make light of what we do, but to have fun at what we do, and and just to put everyone in that that mode of being open to one another. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. because it's yeah. all about the connection, right? It's all about the connection. It is, and um, I was curious, what would you say, like, um, would be your level of, you know, the overall level of satisfaction with the the staff and um, with you and your partners before, like on a scale of one to ten, say, before you mm-hmm. started initiating the fish philosophy and um, and you know until recently. I can give you a perfect example. Um, when I hired the HR consultant and um, the business coach, oh, and I also hired a mentor for the um, for the management staff during that same time period. We actually had a a workshop that we did as a group. It was voluntary, but we were asked to make a clay model of what our day-to-day demeanor was going into work. And I made a clay model of a straight face, just neither like happy nor sad, nothing. just like I'm just I'm here. here. I'm here. Exactly. Exactly. And that was May of 20. 20- 15 um, Mm -hmm. when we had that session and now um, even though we've got a substantial amount of um, new staff on board I I, I'm happy I mean if I had to make that clay model again it would be with a smile absolutely because I feel like the people that we're getting really get the concept of what we're trying to do I feel like I'm showing up in a different way as the CEO of the company I feel like it having an impact not just on the staff but also on the way that I practice medicine and on the way that I engage with my clients now. And that it's a trickle down. You have to lead from the top down. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, if you really want absolute change of this magnitude, if you're number one in the client database, 
the buck ends and, and begins and ends with you. And right. so I absolutely had to commit to doing something different. And I, I wouldn't have done anything differently in these past two years. I yeah. really would not have. Yeah. What I find so inspiring is that there wasn't anything – you know, external that changed. There wasn't somebody from on high that says, Dr. Dunnings, you need to change your practice or anything like that. This this all came from within you and within the practice. If you can do that with your practice, just completely turn it around, it's so inspiring because I think it's, it's possible for other practices to do the same thing. We've been doing some I've had some interviews around burnout in um, human medicine practices, and we always say that there's, you know, there's a personal, there's an individual component to burnout, and then there's the organizational component to burnout. Mm-hmm. And the wonderful thing is that you actually address both, you know, preventing burnout with the coaching that you receive, the personal coaching, but also you took on the task of changing the culture in your practice. And um, not only are the the staff that's there happier, but I would venture to guess that, like you said, the staff that you're attracting is in alignment with the vision that you have for your practice. Do you have any um, feedback from your the owners, the clients, your bottom line, even in terms of the change that you made from, I was going to say from drab to fab. <laughs> I know, I love that line. We have gotten a lot of positive feedback from the clients. The, the changes, I think, have been a little bit more subtle on their end than what I would have liked for it to have been thus far. But that's not surprising to me, and I'm okay with that because in order for the clients to really have the experience that I want them to have, I had to have the right people in place first. Mm -hmm. And so now that I've got the right people in place and now that the culture is revolving around this new mantra, then, you know, I think it's just a matter of time before clients actually start to feel the full force of the change that we've implemented. But in terms of subtle changes, Yes, there has been an improvement in the bottom line. I mean, last year was my best year ever. And, you know, as a new practice, um, you know, over the past, well, I can't say new anymore, but over the past 16 years, I was on a steady rise in gross revenue every single year up until the recession caught up with me in 2011. And then we kind of flatlined 2011 through 2014, mm-hmm. and um, it slowly started to change in 2015, but last year was a, a good year for us, very good year for us. Awesome. Well, you can hear the, yeah. you can hear the, the contentment in your voice, and that speaks volumes, I think. It, it does. It really does. I mean, I, I really was at a such a different place two years ago, um, even to the point where I was questioning, am I really right for this? Should I really be doing this? Or is it time for me to get out and let someone else manage the practice? And the stubborn part of me was like, you can do this. Right. You know, you not back down from the challenge before. And thank goodness um, happened to, upon the right path for myself and the rest is uh, what it is. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, uh, Dr. Andrea Jennings, thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us today. It's really, truly inspiring to hear how you were able to change the culture of your of your veterinary practice from being a place that's full of stress and angst to somewhere that's pleasant, collegial, and um, not only better for the, the staff and for yourself, but for your patients, your clients, and your bottom line. Bravo, bravo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank You're you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, I was wondering if some of the practitioners out there are, if they're inspired by what they've heard and they'd like to contact you uh, to get some ideas, the tips, and um, a little direction. Um, how might they get hold of you, Dr. Downing? Our website is eastatlantaanimalclinic.com, but my email address uh, where people can reach me is d 
R D. Um, everyone calls me Dr. D. <laughs> um, at East <laughs> at East Atlanta Animal Clinic dot com. Awesome, awesome. And if for some reason you you all are listening in and um, don't quite catch that, you can always go to my website www.dianeandsarywin.com. Leave me a note, and I'll make sure that Dr. Dunning gets it so I can connect you both. Well, thanks again, Dr. Dunning. I really appreciate your being on the podcast today. It's a really been inspiring and enlightening. Until next time, everybody, hope you all stay happy and healthy and um, hope you all have a great day. Take care. You've been listening to the Doctor's Life Podcast with Diane Ansari Wynn, MD. Go to wwwdianansari wincom to read show notes, listen to past episodes, share your comments and show ideas, and pick up your free PDF and video of easy and proven strategies that will melt your daily stress away. That's wwwdianansari wincom 